Hello everyone. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for coming here. Uh, we're delighted to do something a little bit different because we have lots of food related programs at lunchtime and this is different. So uh, this came about because Joanna Perrin, who's in the back, Joanna, who's our newest addition, but she's been here for a couple of years and we love her and she works in adult programs. She lives on the North Fork and she sometimes works in the summer at a store called Phoebe and Bell, I believe. And so she came back from her other job one day saying that she had met this terrific person who wrote a, a really nice cookbook and told us about it. We ordered the cookbook. We decided to invite her here and she said yes, so she's here. Um, her cookbook apparently is sort of flying off the shelves. It's a great cookbook. I bought a copy here and it's, it's actually for sale. I do not get a commission, but um, I'll just tell you a couple of things about Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie and her fisherman husband, Alex, run Blue Moon Fish from the North Fork. They sell local fish, shellfish, and smoked fish at New York City Green Markets and have participated in the program since 1988, a long time. Stephanie is a member of the Farmer and Community Advisory Committee with the Grow New York City Green Market Program. Her new, it's a seafood cookbook slash memoir, uh, was released in January, I mean, sorry, July of 2017. And she has a blog, which is at www.bluemoonfish.com. I'm sure if you want that written down, we will be happy to write it down for you. Anyway, please welcome Stephanie Villani. Uh, so we have some smoked fish up here, and also a smoked fish dip, blue fish dip. If you would like to come try some, please, please do. Um, so as uh, as you heard, uh, my husband and I have been selling fish for many, many years. Um, and one of the things I do is give out information. I answer all kinds of questions. I tell people how to cook the fish, I explain about the local fish they're maybe not familiar with, um, how to keep it, how to cook it, how to store it. Um, so I finally uh, was able to write all the fantastic recipes that were floating around our fish stand down and all the information on how to <coughs> prepare fish. Um, so I'm going to read a short story about uh, great white sharks first. And then I'll read another story. And if you have any questions, please stop me and ask. OK. Uh, so one of our fishermen friends was out in Montauk fishing. He was right off the beach. And he had been catching lots of small, great white sharks and throwing them back one after one. You aren't allowed to keep them. And by small, I mean five to six feet. Uh, and this is a true story. So right after he had tossed another great white back into the water, a girl on one of those stand-up paddle boards came along right up to the side of the boat and said, hi, <laughs> I'm from Pennsylvania. We're staying in Montauk for the summer. Uh, that's great, Richie said. Uh, do you know that there are sharks out here? Of course she had no idea. She asked, should I head to shore? <clears throat> Richie was afraid he would scare her, but he said, yes, go back right now. She paddled off and made it safely to shore. He had thrown 12 young, 5-foot great whites back in the water, right where she had been. So I don't think uh, many people don't realize that there's a nursery for great white sharks on the east end of Long Island. And again, this, this is another reason I wrote this book is, I think people on the East End may know things like this. They kind of know what's going on in the fish world. But uh, my customers in the city often do not. So I like to tell them. <laughs> OK, and here's a, a, another story called oh, can, I, can I ask you a question about that yeah, story? Sure. <clears throat> OK, so this story takes place in Montauk. Mm -hmm. Are there equal number of sharks in Southampton? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, they migrate. I I know off of Montauk is the nursery, and I think I believe it's June where there's really a lot of juvenile great white sharks, and they are very protected. You cannot touch them or take them. You know, you'll get a big fine, and they're very strict as they should be. Most sharks are protected. There's a few we can catch, but not not many. Yes. How far from shore was that? fisherman when that woman came up on the paddle Well, he was not that far off the beach, he said. And I mean, the woman paddled out to him, so he wasn't that far off. A laundry yard, is it? Mm, yes. So I, I think, you know, either people forget or they don't realize these, you know, animals, they're, they're there. Uh, I mean, we had beluga whales in the sound a couple years ago. Um, there's pilot whales, you know, they're here. Okay. Okay. Smelly boots is thoughts on the dying industry. Uh, early in the book, I said squid is highly perishable. In case you don't already know, what comes with expired squid is a particularly horrible smell. One likely to clear a room, if not an entire house. Fishing is sometimes a smelly business to be in. So take my word for it, nothing smells as bad as old squid. <laughs> Fishermen have been known to take advantage of this. Revenge stories abound of rancid squid being dumped on a rival's boat deck. I've even heard about a guy who broke into another's truck and poured the water that some rotting squid had been sitting in into the air conditioner vents. <gasps> so much for cooling off after a hard day's work. But of all the pranks I've heard about, there's one story concerning smelly squid that beats them all. Back in the early 80s in Hampton Bays, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, which is charged with regulating the fishery and the fishermen, was hassling one of the fishermen who was building lobster pots in his own yard. They had issued tickets to him repeatedly, and he was getting pretty peeved. Whenever they issued a ticket, it came with a court summons, which meant that a day spent on a court bench rather than on a boat or working on gear, not to mention whatever fine the judge imposed. So after receiving multiple summons, <clears throat> this fisherman finally had enough. That morning of his next court appearance, he got up early, took a pair of rubber boots, stabbed holes all over them, and filled them up with rotten squid. When he showed up in court, he was wearing his holy boots, squishing foul squid juice all over the courtroom. Oh. By the time the stench had reached the judge's bench, everyone who could have had moved over to the far side of the courtroom, leaving the fisherman alone. The, the judge called him up right away, and though taken aback by the smell, still managed to ask, what are you here for? The fisherman slapped his ticket down in the bench, then squished backwards. After he read the ticket, the judge stood up and leaned over the bench to look at the man's smelly, squid-filled boots. He took one look at the fisherman's simpering grin and ordered him away for a psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> Fishermen have to go through a lot in their life's work. Uh, there's a big bureaucracy to deal with. Uh, so this is one of the, uh, some of the problems that the local commercial fishermen face. Um, are things like this. Uh, I also write in the book about some different issues they deal with, like regulations, overdevelopment, um, dock space is getting hard to come by, pollution, the brown tide killed off all the scouts quite a few years ago. Um, and that was a big thing. And uh, this past year was a really good year for Bay Scouts. Yeah. So that's coming back. But it took a good, what, over 20 years, almost 30 years? Uh, so, oh, and then the last issue is climate change, which, you know, seems to be happening more and more. Um, last year, the sea bass showed up earlier than expected. Um, as one of my friends, Paul Greenberg, he also writes about fish issues. He, he has, in his opinion, the climate of the Chesapeake Bay is now our climate. It's, it's warmed up that much. So the sea bass that used to not be here until the middle of June was now here in the beginning of May last year. Only the regulations didn't change. So even though there were many big 
beautiful sea bass, the fishermen couldn't couldn't keep them, couldn't sell them. That's striped bass or sea bass? That's sea bass, the black sea bass. And it's a shame because in the city, um, I know the chefs are dying to get that fish, and it's a fantastic fish. It's uh, really sustainable. It's very plentiful now. It's fresh. It's much better than Chilean sea bass, which is really overfished. And, you know, you really can't beat it. It's a great fish to sell and feel good about eating. And they couldn't do that. So, Is there any were, effort to change that? Uh, yes. Um, Senator Schumer got involved last year and started making some noise about it. And then this year, um, they're still they're still talking about it. I don't know what they, I think they made the season a little shorter for the commercial guys. Now recreational fishing has all different rules. What are the sea bass uh, for selling? For selling? Can you repeat the question? I mean, oh, the sure. Local, the local? Yes. When are the local black sea bass plentiful? Um, I believe spring through the summer and into the fall. You know, um, if we if we're catching them, we'll we'll sell them. Mm -hmm. Hi, do you fish with your husband, or and are there women out there that fish with their husbands? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Which was, uh, are there women out there who fish with their husbands, and do I? Um, I don't really do that. I, I did go out years ago, but he leaves very early in the morning, like 3 o'clock, 3 a.m. And now I have a daughter, and I, uh, I do all the smoking for the business. I do all the paperwork. So I really don't go out with him too often. Um, there are quite a few women. That was actually, I had that same question. Um, I know one woman who's a, she's crew on her husband's boat. They, um, this is um, in Magatuck. No, you know Cindy Kaminsky? Yeah, she is, uh, she's, uh, she's been in the business a very long time, running the fish dock that her husband and her son are fishermen out of Magatuck. So, yes? Uh, okay, sorry. Did you just sleep out? Well, these days, um, Alex never goes out maybe 10 miles or so. Uh, he's, he has a day boat now, so he, he goes out and fishes and comes back, gets his limit and comes back. Years ago, he fished out of Shinnecock on the really big boats, the 80-foot boats that go out for a week or two, um, but he doesn't do that anymore. That's a really tough, tough thing to do. He says that's a young man's game. Um, so he doesn't do that anymore, which I'm glad. So, yeah. Could, could you tell us, I mean, I'm curious about a, a few things. One is like, how did you grow up? I mean, did you meet, did you, were, were you already interested in fishing? Where did he grow up? And I'd also mm -hmm. like to know a little bit about his day. It starts very early, and so what does the day look like for him? Okay, um, well, he's from New York City, actually. Okay. And uh, fishing was not in his family. Um, his parents had a house in Copay on Long Island, and so he came out when he was, I think, 17 or 18. He bought a boat, a little $300 boat, and he went clamming. I guess back in the 70s, there was a lot of people clamming on the Great South Bay, and he, he loved it. He had a great time, he made some money, he was out on the water every day, so he did that for a few years. Um, and then he tried all, he's done all different kinds of fishing on Long Island. He's been out on the big boats catching tunas or doing offshore lobstering. Um, what else? Something else I'm missing. Uh, yes? Are you going to get into cooking fish? To cooking fish? To talk about the cooking yeah. fish? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, usually uh, people start asking me questions about the fish. Okay. Um, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy cod in this area, uh -huh. and I'm surprised you can't get it really often uh, fresh mm -hmm. because we're so close to Cod Bay and mm -hmm. places like that. Um, so you buy it frozen, and it becomes waterlogged. Yeah. And 
So I've been told that you've got to cook it at three to four hundred degrees to really get get it down and get the moisture out so that it resembles something like a reasonable codfish. I don't know. I usually cook it fresh, and we do get fresh cod. You can't find it. It's a little hard to find around well, here. It's, well, I can say is that uh, the frozen is much more available. Right, and it is a lot more watery. Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't know. When you cook it that way at the higher temperature, does it seem to do oh, the yeah. trick? Yeah, I think it improves. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I used to cook it at 350 or something like that, mm -hmm. and, and it's still kind of waterlogged. I usually do bake it in the oven because it's a little soft, you know, tends to fall apart. So yeah. I do like to bake it in the oven. With right. I, I, um, I usually uh, um, bake it with a, um, a tomato sauce. Mm -hmm. it really, it does increase the, the uh, taste of it. One thing, I mean, I know we do, and I'm encouraging my customers to, and maybe you can do, is to um, eat in season with the fish. Like when the cod is in season in the winter, which is winter through spring, they catch a lot of cod off of Montauk. So I would think you could be able to find some good fresh cod fillets. Then in the summer, there's no local cod, um, so we don't sell it then. Um, the green market that we participate in is very strict about only bringing in what is local. This applies to everyone there, the farmers, the fishermen, everyone. So if we're not catching cod, I can't buy it from Boston, say, and sell it. So I just sell the fish in season. Now, a lot of my customers mm -hmm. don't even realize there are seasons for fish. They, they migrate and, and they come at different times of the year. Like, for example, tuna comes in the summer. I have people waiting already for tuna. And it's usually around Memorial Day, the end of May, that it's local here on Long Island. So from then to about October, November, that's the time to eat the tuna. So I would think, like, then you can get really nice, fresh tuna. And then the rest of the year, it's going to be frozen. Well, probably frozen from somewhere else. What about the salmon or swordfish? Do you Swordfish we sell in season. Um, Which is that's about June through November. <laughs> um, you know, salmon we don't sell. I get a lot of people ask for. I think the three most popular fish seems to be tuna, salmon, and cod, and swordfish too. People only want to eat that. They're familiar with it. They know how to cook it. So what I try to do is get people to try some of these other fish that we catch that are very plentiful on Long Island. They're very good very inexpensive and uh, it's good to eat what's sustainable. You had a recipe uh, for, for monkfish. Uh -huh. uh, I love monkfish, but it's always a problem uh, taking the bell. Do you mm -hmm. have a, a secret to do that? <laughs> well, if you're going to cook it like, I think that recipe, it was cut up. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, if you're going to keep the piece whole, sometimes I cook it whole with that membrane on, and then after it's cooked, you can peel it off. Oh, okay. If you're going to cut it up, that doesn't really work, oh. you know? Uh, but that is one trick <clears> I <I'm> found. <throat> and I do that. I ended up smoking monkfish. I didn't think it would be a good fish. There's some up here. Oh, that's great. To, uh, you know, they tell you that only the very oily fish is best to smoke, but you know, I've tried, <laughs> I've tried everything that's left over, and it's, it's delicious. Such a cheap fish to, and it's to buy. it's good. Poor man's lobster. It's delicious. Does it last a long time if you smoke it? It lasts about a week to ten days at the smoked version. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yeah, the season for halibut. Oh, halibut. I don't know. I don't believe we catch that out here, as far as I know. So the same. Would I you buy that's... salmon, or you wouldn't even buy salmon? Oh yeah, I do. I again, I would try to buy it wild when it's in season, which I believe is the summer, June, July, and it's very expensive. If you get the wild stuff, you pay for it. Yeah. But one of the smartest things I think Alaska ever did was 
there's no farmed salmon in Alaska. They're not allowed to farm it there. So everything you buy that's Alaskan, you know it's wild. And that's the best you can get. What are some of the uh, local fishes that you, yeah. you know, and I guess seasons, but what are mm -hmm. some of the ones that you, you know, prefer or can okay. you recommend? Uh, well, you know, we eat a lot of flounder. It might sound boring, but it's so good. And, you know, we spend some time away in the winter, and when we come back, the first thing we do is eat flounder. Um, the scallops. When's the season? Can you tell us the seasons oh, here? Sure. Flounder? Um, flounder is pretty much all year. There's different types of flounder. So in the winter, you would get blackback or yellowtail flounder. In the summer, you would get fluke. And then there are other kinds of flounder. There's something called dabs, which are very small. Um, so it depends. There's different types. It's expensive, when, flounder is. Kind of. Well, everything expensive. Yeah. Yeah. When they say yellowtail, is uh -huh. that flounder? Well, there's the also a fish called yellowtail, oh, which you might see in a sushi restaurant. Yeah. But that's from the West Coast. That's a oh. different fish. So this is the yellowtail flounder. Yeah. Um, sea scallops we get year round. They're very plentiful off of Long Island, and they're very good. <laughs> The bay scallops, you probably know, they're, they're now uh, November to the end of March. Striped bass has a very strict commercial season that opens July 1st to December 15th. Um, so that's the season for that. And the fishermen get a number of tags. They have to tag each fish. That was a fish that was very overfished at one point, to the point where they were afraid, you know, there were none around. And uh, they were able to build that back. That's a big success story with rebuilding the stocks. Now, the recreational <laughs> fishermen, I think, can take them earlier. I don't know if anybody's a recreational fisherman here, but I think they can, I want to say May, but I'm not sure. I know the commercial season. I don't always know the recreation. Well, maybe argument for not farming on it, but kind of not farming. Well, I mean, from what I understand, there are there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. Um, I understand in Scandinavia they're doing it in a very sustainable way. Often they add antibiotics to the fish food. They add uh, something that makes the fish turn a particular color, so it looks orange. Um, I had a friend that actually was involved in a fish farming operation in Ireland, and he said problem when you keep the fish in the pens is they would get attacked by sea lice. It's not very appetizing. He would have to give them, they, they have to be treated for this so that they wouldn't, you know, all get eaten by this parasite. So, yeah, so it's not all that healthy. Often it creates a big dead zone in the ocean underneath where the fish are penned up and they're fed other ground up fish which is also not really a good thing because they're taking that fish from the other fish populations that need that to live. Um, I understand in Chile they're, they have done a lot of damage to the ocean by having these fish farms that aren't, I don't know if they're not regulated or they just don't do a very good job ecologically and they've caused a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. So you know it's right this, it's uh -huh. recreational to April 15th to December 15th. Okay, April through December. Is that different from last year? Uh, no, those is April 15th. Okay. December 15th, but obviously, Shrek has up to 28 inches or larger. Right. And you only allow one as a recreational per day. One per trip? Or yeah. one, one, per one per day? day. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's another it's, thing. It's yeah. different about with the trawlers, because I know even at a Shinnecock, when you go to um, Corgi, right mm -hmm. by the, the uh, Coast Guard's there. They're stuffing up everything, which is really horrible. I mean, mm -hmm. little fish, big fish, you know, they don't care. Mm -hmm. It's really a shame. Well, they're not allowed to keep the small fish, and yeah, I know they're out there checking. Yeah, well, you can go to Cor and you can see it. I see them. They're there by fish and ducks. It's just, it's, it's really disrespectful the way things are. And then little flounder, little fluke, little everything, little striped bass. It's amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of um, unfortunate non rules regulations in that industry. Well, what's, it's very complicated is that each fish has a different regulation. Yeah. And every year it changes, or not, but often it does. Um, this year they're, 
They're regulating blackfish, which they never did before. That's another really great local fish that uh, lots of people are not always familiar with. It's, uh, I think it's similar to a snapper or a grouper. It's very firm and meaty. It's a white fish, but it's very sweet because this fish eats shellfish. So it has a and really nice that? taste. That is in the spring and fall. Um, but, but not in the summer? No, in the summer they move offshore. It's really interesting, you know, each different kind of fish does different things, goes different places, and there's different regulations on each fish. So it's, it's very complicated and often hard to follow, you know, but you have to follow it or, you know, you'll have problems. Mm -hmm. When you buy fish in your local fish store, do you have to be told the point of origin? Yes, I think that's a law now that you have to be told the country that it's from. But I've noticed that they don't always have that information. And if you ask, often they don't know. And I ask sometimes in restaurants too, and that's another place they don't always know where Something the fish is. about the shrimp. Mm -hmm. that, um, they say don't buy it from me. Asia. From Asia, yeah. yeah. But you don't know. Well, if you can possibly buy it, from American fishermen from the Gulf. That's what I would, that would be my first choice. I spent some time in the Florida Keys, and so I get fresh shrimp down there, which is pretty much unheard of. Uh, you always find it frozen. Not, I guess it's not unheard of. Um, but they're catching fantastic, beautiful shrimp. It's probably, I don't know, uh, 12 to $15 a pound. You know, not terrible. Um, our second choice is the Mexican wild fish, just because it's more fresh and it seems to be really good tasting. Is I that would shrimp? avoid. Yeah, I would avoid. I avoid the shrimp from Asia also. When you read about how it is, it's farm raised in filth. It's dirty. It's you know, or it's harvested by people who are slaves, and they're starting to crack down on this, but. You know, eat. no, it doesn't taste good. Often it has no taste. And one way you can tell too is the price is very cheap. Mm. If you ever see the little, um, the little scallops, they call them bay scallops, mm. but they're like six dollars a pound. Those are probably from China, and they have no flavor. You know, they're farm raised. So what I do is wait till the pecanic bays are in season. You know, or get some local sea scallops. But you, can, one way you can tell is price. Uh, bay scallops uh, are shellfish. Yes. Uh, are sea scallops uh, shellfish? Yes, uh huh. They're shellfish too. They're just a different sort of shell. They're round and sort of a smooth shell. Uh -huh. And you know, the bay scallops have the ridges on them. So they look a little different and they're bigger. But uh, yeah, they're shellfish too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or as a kid, uh huh. In the Great South Bay, I think it's pretty much gone. Well, you know, they've come back a bit because um, we've sold them the last couple of years, but just, you know, for a short season, usually June. But for many years, we didn't have them. Like, I mean, a lot, like 10 or 15 years. And my husband, I asked him, why? What happened to them? Where are they? And no one seems to know. Well, someone told me that this was a, a supposed. Um, that the American fishermen didn't catch them. It mm -hmm. was uh, marketable or something. But the Asian fishermen were just taking in and everything. So that they may have taken them away and overcatching them. Right. That could be. I don't know if there's a regulation mm -hmm. on them. I don't <clears throat> think there is. But I mean, honestly, I don't know. Nobody likes it. It's a scary, clean feel. You know, it's hard. People don't like that part of it. Right. What kind yeah. of fish is this? This is low fish low they're fish. talking low about. Fish. It's also called carper fish oh, or sorry. chicken of the sea. And it's a big Long Island thing. Usually, you might see it in the restaurants, a few restaurants around here. And you just you just have the tail on the bone. You fry it up. This is how they're prepared. They're fried, and you eat it like a little chicken drumstick. Um, now, I have a recipe in here of a broiled with some white wine and vegetables. I mean, there's other ways you can cook it, and it's delicious. It's very cheap, 
And it's funny, I've been selling these fish when we have them to some of the best chefs in Manhattan will buy this stuff because, I guess because it's not, it's not always available, it's something different, it's local, and people like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You come? I know they're in the South. Right, right. It's, it's hard to say, no one seems to know like where they are or what the season is or it's just if we can get them, we'll bring them in and people buy them. Mm -hmm. what, when, do you, when did you get them last year? And what was the price per pound? On I think it was in June. And I think the price is like twelve ninety five a pound, which seems really high to me because I know back in the day they were cheaper. Have, has anyone ever seen them in a fish market? I used to snorkel and shoot over here by the canal. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, they were everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. They would just reach yeah. around and shoot these there. We used to go snorkeling and get them. And they would, mm -hmm. everyone said their chicken would seem delicious. They were big, too. Yeah. They were good six, nice. seven inches long. They would come close to the shore. But they didn't disappear for, like you said, 15 years. Yeah, they just disappeared. And then they were back. So well, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, weren't low fish, uh, isn't there a certain way to uh, prepare them? And weren't they? The, the legend has it that they're like uh, poisonous or something? Yes. So um, I've had this question a few times when we sell the, the blowfish. There's a type of blowfish you get in Japan okay. that uh, has is poisonous and can kill you. It's something to do with their liver. Um, this fish, the, the blowfish that we have around here is perfectly safe. And they get it from Chesapeake Bay, I guess, up to here. And that's perfectly safe. I guess there is a type you could get in Florida that could be toxic, sort of like um, like if you eat something with a red tide, it can cause symptoms. It might not necessarily kill you, but it can make you very sick. So, but that's a pretty common question. Talking about blowfish, what has that happened to the wheat fish? Wheat fish haven't been many around lately, in quite a few years, I think. You know, when I first migrated out here, mm -hmm. uh, some years and years ago, um, they were pretty plentiful. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't see them anymore fishing. Well, I think that's true. I think years ago we sold a lot, and we sold plenty. It's, it's a good fish, a very good fish. Um, but in recent years, we haven't had much. We've had a small amount, and that's another seasonal fish, which is spring and spring and fall. They say they start to catch them when the lilacs bloom, which is right around the beginning of May. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have heard that it has to do with the, the water quality in the bay. Um, you know, if there's a lot of building and a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people with nice, beautiful lawns that put a lot of chemicals on them and it runs right into the bay. It kills the eelgrass. So there's not a lot for the fish to eat. Um, it could be that. I don't really know. I mean, I know there's a little bit around, but not like it used to be. But hopefully, you know, if they work on the water quality, I think that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, could we go back? Could we back up to, to your husband's um, sure. day? His day? I, I'm interested in his day, but what his year looks like, things like that. What, what does the day look like? What is his... Okay, um, well, like... We start, we take a break in July, uh, January and February, we take a break. It's the worst time to be fishing. It's the worst time to be standing outside selling fish. Um, in May, he starts doing a lot of maintenance on his boat. He's got to paint the bottom, he's got to fix the net, he's got to work on whatever he has to work on. How big is his boat? It's 36 feet. Is, is he on it by himself? Yeah, he has some help now. He has res always resisted that, so he was on uh, the boat by himself for many years. Um, there's a couple draggers out of Mattituck, so you know that's one of them. Um, and then he starts fishing. At this time of year, it's pretty slow. We don't have a big variety. Um, you know, cod is finishing up. We have flounder. There's some mackerel, um, monkfish. And then as the weather warms up, it'll change a little bit. We'll get some different fish in, like the uh, sea trout. Um, usually sea bass. I don't know what's happening with that this year. Um, then the tuna comes at the end of Memorial Day. And around that time, we get very busy. 
you know, at the farmer's markets. It's summer, everybody's outside, and there's lots of vegetables too. You know, right now there's not too much available at the market, it's a little slow. Yeah. But uh, when we get to May, June, it starts to be high season. And that's a really great time of year. You can just go and pick all your ingredients for your dinner. And, um, you know, everything's there, everything's fresh and local. Um, so we work through the summer and then fall. Fall is a very busy time, too. I'd say really through June through probably October is very busy. And you know, we'll have different things at different times of the year. The fish will change, the cod will end, the tuna will come in, and then the swordfish comes in, then the striped bass comes in, and people kind of wait for each fish. It's kind of like, you know, waiting for the strawberries to be ready. Yeah. And waiting for the asparagus right now. Like, you know, everybody's desperate for anything green. Uh, I'm waiting for the peaches in the summer. So, you know, you kind of move through yeah. the, and the, the fish and the vegetables, you know, will come in together. Yeah, but like the peas will come with the sea trout, you know. Anyway, uh, and then uh, October, I would say it starts to slow down for us at the market. It starts getting colder. Uh, a lot of the fish leave because the water gets too cold and uh, the, the farmers have a lot less to sell. I'd say it's pretty, still pretty good until about Thanksgiving, and then we hit the winter. When you say pretty good, you're talking about selling in New York at the yeah at, at the markets at the farmers there. markets. Yeah, but even the markets out here, like you sell out here as well. Uh, we don't actually. I should tell you that this whole thing started for us is just kind of an accident. Um, you know, my husband wholesale this fish just like all the other fishermen which is they catch the fish, they put it in a box, a truck comes around to the dock and picks it up and takes it away and you never see it. You get a check in the mail a week later. Okay. So they can't, you know, control, they have no control over the price or anything. Um, so my husband did this too and I think his sister lives in Manhattan and she said, you should check out this little farmer's market. Maybe you could come in on the weekend and make some extra cash. So he decided to do it, because he's from the city. He sort of, yeah. you know, he likes talking to people. Yeah. He didn't mind driving in. So we drove in with a pickup truck, and he sold everything. And uh, it just sort of got bigger and bigger. Uh, people were <laughs> so delighted to get fresh fish and shellfish. So that's what you do now, and that's rather, what than, we do. Yes. rather than box it and send it to Yes, but we, it's become so, it became so popular that that's become our main business now. Okay. Yeah, like, and the good thing is we're able to make a decent living this way right. because we get to set the price, and our prices, I think, are pretty reasonable compared to Manhattan prices. You know, the fish is much fresher than you can find. Right. Are the green markets 14th Street? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, they have different locations. Oh. So what about the day? I want to hear about before somebody else gets okay, in there. Uh, uh, let me just answer her question. Uh, we do, we're in Tribeca and, on Saturday and in Brooklyn Grand Army Plaza on Saturday. And I did do Union Square on Wednesday, but I stopped that this year. Okay, so now the day, my husband's day. Um, he gets up very early and he's out of the house by 3, 3.30. He doesn't sleep very much. He's just on that schedule all the time. He packs a little lunch for himself and he heads to the boat um, and he heads out. And sometimes he goes pretty far off to the east or west. Sometimes he fishes right in front of Matatook Inlet, depending on where he's going, what he's going for, you know. It's, it's amazing. In this book, there's a picture of the chart that he has on his boat. Um, and it's this big chart of the bottom of the sound and he's got everything marked like it must have taken it took him decades really to mark it up where the rocks are where the lumps are there was a plane crash here there's you know a deep hole here and he has it all marked and he knows well the deep hole is where I catch whatever blackfish or the rocks is where I catch the blackfish but you can't go too far or you'll hit it you know so it's like it's really like a lifetime of knowledge and the fishermen too, 
they they all tend to go out at the same time and they're totally big gossips so they get on they would get on the radio or now it's the cell phone and just talk about everything like where what they're catching or where they should go or who did what or you know there are um, there used to be uh, lobstermen, a lot of lobstermen out in the sound, and that was sort of a big thing. It was like buddy heads, the fishermen and the lobstermen, because the lobstermen would put their traps where the fishermen drag their nets. So they're always having problems, you know, because it's like uh, they have their territory, and you're supposed to stay in your territory or it causes problems. So, but now that there's hardly any lobsters around anymore, they don't have that problem anymore. It goes every day. Yeah, he pretty much goes every day he can, except for when he's at the market, or, or, or if it's really bad weather. Um, he's usually back, these days he's back pretty early, by maybe 11, 10 or 11. Um, whatever he's fishing for, if he gets his limit, he comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephanie, you're saying that your husband um, is a dragger on a boat. Mm -hmm. How does he if he works by himself? How does he get rid of all the other fish that he's not supposed to get? How does that work out? Um, well, when he the net fills up with fish and he opens it and it all falls on the board the deck, yeah. on the deck. So he he kneels down and goes through every fish. He's got baskets and he's there's a different measurement for each fish too. So like there's a fluke. If it's big enough, he keeps it. If it's too small, he throws it off the end of the boat. There's like two little, I don't know what they're called, two little holes that the, the fish goes go out. There's a lot of spider crabs, those are worth nothing, they all go out. Um, there's a lot of sea robins and stuff. Actually, it, I sell sea robin, so we keep some of those. That's pretty much a trash fish for all the fishermen around here. And then he's got um, these like boards that have the measurements marked of whatever fish. So like if he gets a fluke and he's not sure if it's the right size, he'll measure it keep it or throw it away. And he goes through the whole deck. So it's a, it's a poundage for the whole day, what all types of fish is how they do it? No, a limit or the, it's a limit. It's kind of struggle as to what, how many pounds he's got a fluke or this or that. He has to judge it himself to be his eye and his mind. I guess so. I guess he does do it himself because it's like 70 pounds per fluke. Of, at last year it was 70 pounds per fluke. So per day. Yeah, and then other fish there's no limits on. Or other fish he won't get much of, you know. We do, we sell, um, I'd say, they call it trash fish. Like the sea robins, skate, dogfish, which is sand shark. Those fish which aren't really worth a lot of money. A lot of the fishermen think they're, you know, not worth anything, so they just throw them back. Well, the sea robins are a basic species from Asia. The sea robins are? I hadn't heard that. It's guaranteed. Oh. The same thing with Chilean sea bass. That that does us a name. The yeah. Right? You know, yeah, they made it up. The it's a marketing they, they, term. For the audience, you can tell what, what the real name is. Patagonian toothfish. Yeah, yeah. Look it up. It looks like a barracuda. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there any demand for bluefish? Oh, yeah. I sell a lot of bluefish. People love it, and it's so good. And not everybody likes it because it's very strong. But I find a lot of people who don't like it have never had it really fresh. So if you have it really fresh, it's good. Uh, so yeah, I sell quite a bit of that. And then I started smoking it, again, just as a side thing, because we had some left over. I didn't want to throw it away. So we started smoking the bluefish. And when you smoke it, a lot of the oil comes out. So it's a little less you know, strong. So uh, some people like the smoked and not the fresh. So we actually do a fair amount of bluefish. And again, it's like real local plentiful fish. Do you fish for blues or? Yeah, do you eat them too? No? I have, a, I have a really good recipe in here for bluefish with gin. And when I first heard it, I thought, I don't know about this. I guess <laughs> you have to drink it first. I guess it's a Nantucket recipe that you pour the gin on it and you roast it in the oven, and it's really good. So, just saying. Just for the audience to know that when you catch a bluefish, you got to get it, bleed it out. That's the whole point. It stays fresher and it, it meat stays not as oily when you bleed the fish upside down. You know, whatever it is. I don't know if they yeah. do that anymore. 
No, I think. That's the better way of doing it. Much tastier. Yeah, I think some of them, uh, the fishermen, they bleed out the fluke too to sell to some of the Japanese buyers. Yeah, so, uh, but I don't think any of the fishermen we you know do that. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, maybe some of the recreational do that. Workers is a good eating fish. It's a good fish. We do really well with it, you know? I'm hoping the Food Network uh, talks about the sea rocks because it's an invasive species. That would be good. You know, they're trying um, on lionfish. Are you familiar with yeah, that? Invasive that. species yeah. in the Keys. Um, you're seeing more of that. Like they're trying to get the fishermen to fish for that fish right. so they can get rid of them. Give it a fancy name, I'm sure you see that. Yeah, and there's no predator <laughs> for this no fish, so they're exactly. everywhere. Right. So they're encouraging them to catch. Right. Another fish they're encouraging fishermen to catch is the dogfish, the sand shark. Um, especially in New England, there's so many of them. They're, they're worth 75 cents a pound. You know, pretty cheap. People don't know what they are. And I sell them every summer. It's, it's a really good fish. I smoke them. It's a very firm white fish. I guess it's not really a true shark. It looks like a shark, but it has a skimmer mouth, not big teeth. Um, but that's a really good fish. I encourage people to eat. You know, they, they're trying to make a market for that fish to get the chefs to serve it. But so far, I don't think they've had too much luck with it. Stephanie, is this a good time to have people just have a taste and then have a few more questions? Sure. Absolutely. Does anybody want to go up and have a